All right, let's pray. God, we want to thank you for the gift of tonight, Lord, the, the gift of your word to us, Lord. I thank you for these, uh, as I look around the room, these faithful men, men that, that try to put themselves in the position of a disciple. That says, choose to sit at your feet, choose to hear what you have to say, because, Lord, your word has precedent in their life, Lord. And, uh, and Lord, I, I believe you want to speak to us through your word tonight. And uh, your Holy Spirit, God, I just invite the, the presence of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to rightly divide this word into each man's life, myself included. Uh, if anybody watches this at some point later on um, YouTube or whatnot, and bless them in that as well. And God, we just pray for uh, you to be glorified in our time together. Uh, those confirming words, those rhema words, those uh, prophetic words that you might be speaking to us tonight. Lord, that you be glorified in this time. And Lord, that, that we would see you more clearly. And uh, Lord, delight ourselves in you in a special way, Lord, even as we see uh, the man in our text tonight, Habakkuk. Lord, uh, delight in you. So Lord, we lift up this time to you and ask you to open up our hearts to your word and your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So Habakkuk, chapter 3. We're going to close the book of Habakkuk tonight. How many of you have been here for all three? Or just be Some of y'all haven't been to the other ones. So I'll give a synopsis before we jump into chapter 3. And it really is, it's a good... Um, there's so much to talk about actually in this book, but there's it's it's a it's a good book to sit down and read just straight through to get the full perspective of it. I'll try to do my best without rehashing everything. Would encourage you to go online. I think Pastor Tom did a really good job. He had some good media stuff that he incorporated in his Bible studies that I do not have. <laughs> so allude to that so you can go look at that. But Habakkuk. Just in a nutshell, you know, he was uh, the name Habakkuk. It's not a hundred percent understood uh, about him personally. There's uh, allusions to the time frames that we see in the text based on who he's talking about. Um, chapter one and chapter two, basically, it's a little bit of a back and forth between him and the Lord. Uh, he's got a complaint initially. That he has about the, the spiritual condition of the people there in Jerusalem. I believe he was in the southern kingdom, the last prophet in the southern kingdom before the kingdoms divide. When you see in the Bible, um, when Second Kings ends and all that, he was the last prophet to uh, the uh, southern kingdom. That was the southern split there with Judea, Jerusalem, and all that. So that is um, the time frame is around 609 BC. Um, if you look, and you can go online and look at some of these studies to get a little picture of a bigger scope of the time frame, but I, I would consider in seeing uh, Habakkuk around this time frame, uh, the stuff that he hears from the Lord about, so basically complains to the Lord, God responds to him with something he doesn't necessarily like, he gets uh, a complaint about the of apostasy, the bad spiritual condition of the people, and the Lord basically tells them the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, his crew, you're hearing about them, they're on the rise. He hasn't seen Nebuchadnezzar do the first you know, captivity and take away. He did not witness that. I mean, he may have witnessed it later, but in the writing, we don't believe that he witnessed that at this point. And so, from what we understand, he complains this thing to the Lord, and God's saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to basically use these Babylonians to judge my people. And he, he's like, goes back to the Lord, whoa, you know, these people are ungodly. This isn't, what, what are you doing, God? You know, he's, the Ju Judeans are more righteous than they are, you know, and, uh, and God, you know, responds to uh, Habakkuk in chapter 2, uh, saying, and, and he puts himself up, Habakkuk responds to the Lord. So question number one, he goes to God with a complaint about the spiritual condition. God responds, saying he's going to use the Babylonians to judge the Israelites. Chapter 2, uh, he sets himself up, and this is a good lesson for us practically too, but he sets himself up in a tower to listen to the Lord. So he doesn't just like fruitlessly throw up prayers. You know, you hear people do that these days, and it's like, oh, I'm going to pray, or whatever, you know. 
But he actually sets up time to sit and listen to the Lord. And God speaks to him. And that's where we get the famous verse in Habakkuk chapter 2, where it talks about the just shall live by faith. He gives him a vision, and uh, he gets a word from the Lord that says the just shall live by faith there in verse 4, back to 2. It's quoted in Galatians, Hebrews, and Romans by Paul. And it's sort of the high holy ground, one of the scriptures from the Old Testament that's really lifted up in the New Testament, at least in those passages. And Habakkuk, essentially, after hearing from the Lord, this, this word from God, he actually, you know, God responds in love and mercy, giving him a picture of what he's going to do to the Babylonians. You know, basically Nebuchadnezzar and his group, basically the Babylonians are going to implode is what's going to happen. They're going to do their wicked thing that they were doing to everybody else, and that's going to, basically, they're going to reap what they sow. Is essentially what God talks about. Tom talked about it, the five woes. Um, you can go and look at that. I think it's interesting to compare that, if you're doing a study further on this, to the seven woes that Jesus gave in Matthew 23 to the Pharisees. Just, you know, if you like woe study, <laughs> so when you get woke, listen to some woes. But no, but um, so that's kind of the point that Habakkuk is at in, in this thing. God responds to him that second time there in chapter two, gives him. That'll be it. Just flew behind it. Repeat that thing in the name of Jesus right now. All right, but uh, is he coming around again? Oh, honey. <laughs> the enemy is not going to hear this. No. There he is. The devil is dead. I'm going to edit that part of the video and that started. <laughs> Where, old death, is your sting? You get one too? Yeah, that's number four. That's the fourth one? Yeah. We've got to have to yeah, we we'll research this room here. <laughs> is there something in the trash? There is? Oh, okay. Like I said, there's more bees. It's like, whoa. I got some bee stories. Me and Denny got some bee stories. I won't get into that. <laughs> I got more of the stories than one I have. We won't get it. Back to our text. Not the enemy just sharpens, right? But anyway, so there's a lot of stuff out of the gate that, that Habakkuk is dealing with and gets us back and forth from the Lord. But we see that word from the Lord. That, that's echoed again in the New Testament, I believe, settled in Habakkuk's heart. And this is where Habakkuk chapter 3, where I'm going to cover tonight, we're going to look at tonight, where that comes into play. Because uh, it, essentially, Habakkuk chapter 3 is a, uh, it's called, we see in the first verse, we're going to start, you know, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1. It says, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. On the Shiganoth. You know, like, what in the world is a Shiganoth? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, what, what we get from it and all the Bible dictionaries and pieces of information you read is, is basically this is a passionate song or a poem, if you will, uh, from Habakkuk. And, and that's the emphasis, excuse me, is that it is passionate. This is like a real heart rendering. Um, you know, him pouring himself out to the Lord. Response to God's response. And I think it's predicated again upon Habakkuk's response to God's word. He says, the just shall live by faith. Because when you look at the scope of the context of the book, and you look at some comparable things for ourselves, you know, we would probably be a little bit frazzled, a little bit irritated, a little bit frustrated, like Habakkuk was. I mean, if we were looking at the spiritual condition of perhaps our family on an individual level, and we're thinking, man, spiritual darkness, you know, there's, there's, things are rough here, Lord, you know, please do something. And then God responds like, hey, I got the Al-Qaeda over here, we'll just whip up on you a little bit. You know, get, get that spiritual darkness out. Whoa, Lord. You know, that's basically what Habakkuk was doing. The Babylonians were doing that. And then, whoa, Lord. Wait a minute. And then God says, you know, wait a minute. The just shall live by faith. There's this call to 
trust God without seeing with our eyes in the moment the goodness of God. And we all, as far as Christ, have come to that point in those places where it seems like the good of, goodness of God is invading us. Where it's like, man, I don't see the Lord at work in this area like Habakkuk, you know, in, in the nation of Israel there. I don't, I don't see it happening. And then going to the Lord, wrestling with the Lord in prayer, kind of like Habakkuk did, like Jacob did, but wrestling with the Lord in prayer. And then God said, hey, walk by faith, trust me. The just shall live by faith. And we see some allusions to some more of this stuff as we get into uh, this text. So Psalm 45, I want to put this at my heart. is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. I am not the best at writing down and chronicling the things that the Lord does in my life. Uh, if I write it down, the bad thing for me is I go back and I can't read it. So it's <laughs> so like... I really don't know what the Lord was doing there. You know, it was something about something here. You know, but but but, but it is uh, as we read the rest of this prayer together. It's a reflective prayer in a lot of ways. Uh, bulk of it is, but you know, it, it, I think it's a, it's a it's a healthy thing to attempt those things. But finding a way, at the very least, of of reiterating um, the things of the Lord in, in in your life is a helpful thing. Obviously, this is a passionate. You know, it's going to be a song. But verse 2, here in chapter 3 of uh, Habakkuk, it says, O Lord, I've heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. This is, I, I think of so many things when I think of this, but you know, I think of the, the tax collector, you know, beating his chest, God have mercy on me, right? You know, is, is a thought that comes to mind, but essentially we see Habakkuk making a couple of petitions here. He's, he's afraid of the judgment God's going to issue, verse 2. And we see the other part of verse 2. He's petitioning, revive your work in the midst of the years. The years... Ultimately, we know, and he doesn't know this, maybe at the moment, maybe he does know this, and it's alluding to it as he's praying his petition to God, but it's going to be those 70 years in captivity. So, there's a petition of God, revive your work in the midst of the captivity. And, and God essentially is, answers this prayer in a huge way. Jeremiah continues to prophesy, Ezekiel continues to prophesy. You know, another interesting illusion and possibility, this is one thing I forgot to mention out from the outset, but is that, you know, Habakkuk may have been in the temple at the time that Daniel was in Jerusalem. And Daniel being a young man at that time. You know, maybe younger than, uh, maybe too young to be in the temple serving or in capacity like that. But, you know, if we look back at Daniel chapter 1 and 2, I remember, you know, from going through these studies, I think the second lesson I taught on Daniel chapter 1, I kind of went through the scriptures and kings, speaking of Josiah, which is one of the kings that died off. Pastor Tom alluded to these things when he went through the first couple of chapters. But, you know, Josiah, not Josiah, is that right? Josiah, did I say that right? Did I say that right? Josiah. Josiah, let me say, I'm sorry, I got my notes. I know I'm questioning myself. Yeah, Josiah, I said it correctly. It was a good king. There was a revival there in that time period. And that was been the time period that Daniel's parents were probably alive. So there was some fire that at least, at least caught on enough to pass along, you know, that part to the children, you know, to somebody like Daniel that was towards his early foundations, if you will. But, you know, Josiah makes a bad decision, tries to go against the king of Pharaoh. Right, and this Pharaoh just was like, "What are you doing?" You know, if you go back, you, you know, search of Josiah in the Old Testament, but basically, he's like, "What are you doing?" And trying to come against me, and Josiah comes against me anyway, and gets killed. And uh, it's, it's a bad thing. He was a he was a great king, uh, apart from that. <laughs> but you know, this Pharaoh, you know, wars and against Nebuchadnezzar later, the Battle of Carchemish. And so, this is sort of a timeline of things that are going on behind the scenes. Um, Back in Jerusalem, Habakkuk, we 
I believe we'll see from this text at the end, had to be at least a priest as well as a prophet, possibly, because he's handing the song off to for people to sing there in the temple, so that was maybe a close relationship. A lot of scholars believe that. Um, so there may have been an influence of this very book that we're reading, you know, on the life of Daniel, who would be one that was a huge impact in Babylon, obviously. And also in Babylon, things came up. I'm talking about an answer to this prayer, revive your work in the midst of the years. We know that synagogues were formed during this time period. Because in uh, the Jerusalem, at their time period, it was always the temple worship. Everybody went to the temple for worship in Jerusalem. But there was no temple when they had the three raids of captivity that took place. The first one, uh, 607 B.C., probably took Daniel. 659 B.C. took uh, Ezekiel. And 587 B.C. was the last uh, raid of taking people captive from uh, the captivity to captivity in Babylon. But they ended up having to do something else, and synagogues were created. And essentially, synagogues became a thing afterwards. You know, we know that uh, I've been to synagogues myself in, like, Turkey, you know, in, uh, in the Middle East. So there's synagogues spread throughout different places, obviously the place where Paul went and preached. So God is answering his prayer, is what we're seeing in this text. And I think it's a good thing, you know, in the midst of going through something hard, is, is, is to be finding ourselves in the work that God is calling us to. You know, the Bible says a few things, and, and, I, and I find it tough to incorporate in my life the things that I see what the Bible says. It says to do the work of evangelists. It talks about that in the Bible. And I have to think to myself, God, how am I incorporating evangelism in my life? You know, you know it's, it's, it's one of the most critical works that we're left to in the Great Commission. I love this prayer, uh, or this psalm, Psalm 90, verse 12 through 17. It says, so teach us, this is a great psalm, uh, 90, 12 through 17. It says, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us in the early, us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad according to the days which you have afflicted us. The years in which we have seen evil. So this is what they're going to go through with Babylon and exile. Let us work, let your work appear to your servants and the glory to their children. And let the beauty of our Lord God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. It's a great little prayer to pray for you off the work in the morning, right? Yes, let the Lord establish you. Now this obviously... You know, it talks about the New Testament, work hard and heartily unto the Lord. The beauty of, of following Jesus is that, and you may understand this, it is something that you, again, you know, want to still to people you have an influence over, whether it be your co-worker, your boss, or your family, or young kids, or whatever, is that our work can have an eternal purpose in it. As mundane as we might think it may be, you know, like I throw a bag of chips on the shelf, whoop de doo right? <laughs> you know? but, but, but if it's for the glory and the excellency of the kingdom of God, there's purpose behind it. It can be established for eternity. It don't have to be some frivolous, oh, it's another day, another day, I hear so many people complain. It's, it irritates me when I hear it. But, it's, um, but God can be faithful in every aspect of our life. That's one aspect. The other aspect of this, I think, is really good. Um, I like what David Gutzik had to say. This is part of the questions he put in his commentary on some of this stuff. Check your conduct. Does your walk glorify the Lord as it should? How is your private conduct, which only the Lord sees? Check your conversation. Is your speech profane or impure? Do you talk about Jesus with others? Check your communion. Are you living and growing and abiding life with Jesus? Is there Good, good areas just kind of to check to see how our integrity is, our work is in that sense. Our work produces something. You know, do we honor the Lord with what it produces, our tithe, our tax? You know, those are, these are areas that we can glorify God. It seems super practical, but glorify the Lord in those areas. And I, I love this thing that, um, you know, the back does, a lot of the prophets do, any 
person that has a real relationship with the Lord should do is be in that place of continually putting yourself before the mercy seat of the Lord. That's, that's what he's doing there. And, and as, as he's reflecting on this, he's, he's like, man, God, there in verse 2, you know, he heard, heard what God had to say, he was afraid. What might happen? How God's going to let this thing work out? So he petitions on behalf of it. And he's saying, remember your mercy in the midst of this affliction. Remember your mercy. Let's pick up verse 3. It says, so God came from Timnah, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. Now, Selah here is, is, a, is a pause moment. Okay, let's go. That's the first time. That was a pause one. All right, but um, but the, there is some stuff to this. I'm, I'm going to try to do my best to go through this part of the text. Not super rapid fire, because a lot of these uh, things from verse 3 down to, uh, let's see, we're on to verse 16. It's, it's, it's a lot of it's reflective. Habakkuk is reflective of God's work in previous generations. And this is huge if you go through difficult times or you're getting ready to go through difficult times, difficult circumstances and situations. is being reflective of where you have seen God work in your life. You know, the, the, it's, it's important. And we see that's why this is the bulk of the message in Habakkuk 3. So God came from Timnah, the Holy One from Mount Korah, Sabah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of His praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from His hand, and there His power was hidden. Some people say Matthew uh, Henry in his commentary says could have been like a flashing of writing the tablets of the commandments. There, that, that may be an allusion to that. <laughs> I should have tattled this map. All right, but um, so we see here the reflection is going toward Mount Sinai. This, you know, this, these areas, Timnah is a poetic term for describing uh, this, Mount Paran, and Selah, or not Selah, but Mount Paran, is a description of God revealing himself at Mount Sinai. We've actually covered this on Thursday night more deeply if you want to look at that text in Math, uh, Exodus 19. You know, you go can we get a broader perspective that covers that area, that, that visual. And it says, before him, that's the Lord, went pestilence, and fever followed at his feet. And if you're reading the King James there, it may say, before him went pestilence and burning coals at his feet. This is alluding to judgments, perhaps, upon the Egyptians. You know, it's a, maybe a subtle reminder that Habakkuk is throwing up to the Lord, like, hey, judge the Egyptians. <laughs> Don't forget about the, the, the other guys, right? We got some stuff going on. All right. <laughs> but, um, so he's alluding to the judgments, and he's alluding to potentially the fire, the burning coals there. Uh, that's interpreted in the New King James fever, but in the Old King James it says burning coals. Could be, he could be alluding to the plagues that fell on Egypt, potentially. It's not 100% that we would know that. And this is, you know, not in any way like a description of God's feet or the first case of athlete's foot or something like that, fever father's feet or anything like that at all. But it's just an allusion to his judgments upon the Egyptians. Now, verse 6. It says, he stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills were bowed. His ways are everlasting. Now, I've got a small map since I'm, I do more media on the stage because basically there's a media team that does it when I'm in here. <laughs> I have to do my own media, so I have it crossed over. I to learn from Steve and Tom on those, but I made a, I got a map. You can hand this out or hand it around and just take a glimpse at it. 
But it's, uh, you know, it says there in verse 6, He stood, He measured the earth, He looked, and He started the nations. This could be, and many think that it is, an allusion to the parameters that God gave him concerning the promised land and the nations that were influenced, no doubt, by the Exodus. And there was sort of a fear, and this is what Habakkuk is reflecting on. Um, you know, the mountains were scattered. Basically, there was, you know, this contention, you remember, in Joshua, you know, Rahab, 40 years after, was totally aware and letting the Joshua and the people know, hey, our people's hearts are melting because of fear of you. So this could be a connection point. And Habakkuk's remembering this. He's bringing this into remembrance. He got whipped up on you showed your glory, you know, in Mount Sinai. You, you judged Egypt. You know, the, the, you, you measured out the land, the earth for us. Now, you know, I gave you that picture. Uh, that's actually what the, the line should be. You know, if God had 100% access, the people of God had 100% access to the land. That's the map that I gave you guys were actual parameters of what it should be. So basically, there's like no Lebanon, no Iraq. I mean, it's all swallowed up. And it's supposed to be Israel, technically. And it's funny, when I was studying Daniel, when I was reading a guy that was like, this is what they're proposing. It was like an like a agnostic atheist. He's like, the Jews are crazy. They're going to take over the world. You know, it's just showing this little, you know, the, the actual parameters, you know, the biblical parameters God had given. So there's, there's a remembrance there. Now, verse 7, it says, I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction, the curtains of the land of Midian trembled. This could be one of two things. There's a couple of different references that would have predated Habakkuk uh, concerning this could be the, uh, the wanderings in the desert with Moses and the Israelites that, that was uh, alluding to the people of Israel uh, going on. There's also references, if you want to look these sections up, Judges chapter 3, verse 8. Uh, Othniel uh, delivered Cushan. Uh, to uh, the Lord delivered uh, Cushan under Othniel's judgment in Judges 3 8 and in Judges 7 13. Uh, Gideon has a dream where a barley cake in a dream overthrew uh, the tent of Midian. So it could be allusions to other judgments that, that are mentioned um, that, that Habakkuk's uh, pondering. You know, it's hard to adjudicate which one is. It's absolutely this or absolutely that. And then some commentators disagree. But there's some information there you can research further. There's references and judges. But there's the reflection, again, going on in his mind about how God dealt with situations in the past. Verse 8 says, O Lord, you were displeased with the rivers. Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses? Your chariots of salvation. Your bow was made quite ready, and oaths were sworn over your arrows. Say la. Alright. So we pause for a minute. So this, you know, could be strong references concerning uh, the Red Sea and the Jordan River. Um, God's, in a sense, coming against. The rivers, at least, and that's the mind's eye of Habakkuk concerning uh, the Lord dealing with things that were obstacles, leading them further into and towards the promised land. And, and no doubt the Red Sea stuff, it's, it's, it's littered throughout other parts of the Scripture for the people to remember. As, as, a, as a hallmark, a special moment in the New Testament, we talked about this when we went through the Bible study, I think Exodus 14. Um, you know, being a picture in the New Testament, it describes as a picture of baptism. You know, you know, coming up, being saved, if you will, out of Egypt, and then going through the Red Sea is a picture of, you know, being baptized and going to receive the promises of God. But God, you know, there's a focus on this. That you rode out the chariots and horses of salvation. You know, uh, this does allude to potentially God owning horses. At the time period, of the people of Exodus, which would have been a rare thing to consider, not saying it was an impossible thing to consider, because basically the slaves didn't have as much, but you know they did get plundered. They did plunder the Egyptians right before they left, so maybe they did. You know they got hooked up with some 
wild stallions that were, you know, like, hey, I got this prize horse from my Egyptian neighbor, you know, taking it through the thing, possibly, so that these things could be accurate there. Now, uh, finishing back up verse 9, it says that you divided the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. You know, this is, you know, again, the, the thought process of some of what may have been going on with the Red Sea passing. You know, and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to ponder. You know, the overflowing water passed by the deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. To be considering a miracle as high and as amazing as what went on the Red Sea. Imagining walls of water literally sitting side by side as you go through these things. It's a, you know, you get a huge point to ponder uh, and looking at these things. I always kind of wish they would come out with a good quality Ten Commandment movie. <laughs> They're also I got the Ten Commandments for like ten bucks at Walmart, the old Cecil DeMille version of nineteen fifty. It's probably the best in a lot of its accuracy in some senses, but it still goes off the rails. I'm like, yeah, what do you mean? You know, it's, it's a little out there. Never never watch the Christian Bell version because it is horrible. But um, as much as we know about it, I think we can hear it right, but sorry, side note. Verse eleven. He's continuing to ponder. It says, The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation, and at the light of your arrows they went, and at the shining of your glittering spear. This, obviously, speaking of Joshua chapter 10, you know, the valley of Ajalon. There is, man, that, that whole chapter of Joshua 10 and some of the preceding chapters is just jam packed full of lessons. I don't know if we still have the YouTube, probably the men's studies on the bridge YouTube channel. You go back and listen to some of those, but it's it's an amazing uh, consideration. You know, I think of one of the things, perhaps maybe as men, that you could gather from that is Joshua essentially made a pact with the Gideonites, who was who was duped into doing this. He didn't pray about it. You know, they came, they put up a front because they had heard about some of the Jericho stuff going down. And they're a little apprehensive by hearing about these things. And they come up and they make a front. And Joshua makes an agreement without considering the Lord. But one of the things that amazes me about this is God's seriousness of about us keeping our word. Why? Because the Valley of Ajalon, Joshua chapter 10, the whole sun stands still story. It all pivots around him going up to defend the Gibeonites. Why? Because he made a pact. Based on what? Pretense. Not seeking God. But God still stood with him to see through that commitment of his word. And what did God do? This is, I tell my wife, I actually bring this up in counseling from time to time. But you know, what did, what did God do in the Valley of Ashland? Well, the Gideon, I made a compromised agreement. So you could initially from the outset look at it and say, well, that was wrong. Now, how many compromised agreements do we make in our life? Maybe you've been in a marriage that didn't work out. Maybe you've been in uh, you know, a business agreement that didn't work out. You know, there's a lot of them that approach us on a regular basis. But you made an agreement to do something. Maybe it wasn't the right thing. Maybe you didn't seek the Lord. But what ended up happening? Joshua has to defend these guys. He goes to defend them. And what ends up happening? They bring all of hell's devils and enemy up to the valley. You know, it's like, you know, it's like it's, we're defending, helping the Gibeonites, and all of a sudden they bring everybody and their mother and all the other neighboring tribes. So it's now they're fighting against a bigger tribe. And God shows up in a miraculous way. In Joshua chapter 10, he starts raining down stones and stuff, and uh, God gives them the sun stands still, the miracle, to give them the time to deal with all the enemy at once. And sometimes... Our compromised agreements can put us in situations where we have to defend somebody we wouldn't have thought we should have been <laughs> defending in the first place or partnering with or helping or serving. And they bring all kinds of problems along with them. But guess what? You and I were witnesses for Christ. And the enemy is getting tore up on all different levels. And sometimes you don't see it. You know, try to, try to be encouraged by this because sometimes you don't see how the, the Lord is using you. You know, you're bringing, you, you know, your friends are hanging out with this kid and got 10 other bad kids. And you go over there and all of a sudden, 
your witness for Christ is having a ripple effect that's defeating and damaging the kingdom of darkness in a powerful way. And so it's, it's just a side thought as we're meditating on these things. And keep in mind, you know, the Lord will see you through even compromised situations. But let's pick back up here. Um, verse 14. It says, You thrust through his own arrows, the hedge, the head of his the villages. You thrust through with his own arrows, the head of his villages. You know, Proverbs 26 rolls on a stone, will have it roll back on him. You know, this is Basically, you're taking the weapons of the enemy and you're turning it right back on the head of the enemy. This is what we're seeing. You're thrusting the arrows of his head in his own villages. This could be an allusion specifically to Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh inflicted pain, inflicted slavery. And if you remember the plagues when we went through them, you can go online and listen to those. We went through them here not too long ago. But uh, a lot of the plagues, the gods and goddesses that were judged during those plagues, were things that they honored and worship, and God just turned it right back on them. You know, oh, you want to worship frogs? There's a zillion of them. You know, bah, they're all over the place. You know, so it's you know the Lord allows those things to happen. It says there, pick it back up, verse fourteen. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter. Them. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You know, this again could be alluding to the, the armies of Pharaoh coming against the people of Israel like a whirlwind to try to scatter them, to fight against them. And their rejoicing was like the feasting on the poor in secret. This is just the rejoicing of the enemy, of people in this world. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a sick thing that people prey on the poor. You know, I mean, they do it all the time. I mean, you know, if, if you look... You know, many of you are aware of some of these things, but you know we we bless as a government lower income families and encourage them to not get married. You know, single women. You know, it's just been along the books for a long time, and, and it keeps people in poverty and it separates and divides families, which is one of the things that God puts a, a high emphasis on the importance of the, the structure of the family, the teaching the word of God to the family, and all those things. It's just the way the enemy works. Is to and then they get a kick out of it. They're rejoicing, feasting on the poor in secret, of of of, of using and abusing poor people. We see it in our politics. We see it. It's across planet Earth, really, in a lot of ways. That this kind of stuff goes on. And the Bible says in First Corinthians thirteen, the quality of love does not. You know, one of the things that rejoices not in iniquity. Right. And obviously this is an evil type of thing. You know, uh, God does laugh and rejoice. You know, even laughs and say rejoice. At, you know, then it talks about Proverbs 1, the, 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 the enemy that tries to gang up and go against God and his people. When he falls, God laughs at that. Elijah kind of has some condescending humor at the Mount Carmel for the prophets there. So he has sort of a, there is some, some sort of, I've got to identify with that problem more than my mother humor. But you know, but rejoicing in in someone else's you know falling and failures and things of that sort is something that's not you know in God's heart for love of people. Now about the poor, real quickly, just a couple quick verses on that. We're going to the next section. In Proverbs twenty two sixteen, it says, "He who presses the poor to increase his riches and gives he gives to the rich will surely come to poverty." The Egyptians learned this the hard way. Proverbs 22, 22, 23, it says, Do not rob the poor because he is poor, nor oppress the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord will plead their cause and plunder the soul of those who plunder them. And you contrast that, there's several sections of Scripture. I had like 20, I dropped it down to like two. <laughs> but then I put a bunch to you just to see how God deals with the poor, just a few. Exodus 22, 25, he doesn't charge interest to the poor. Leviticus 19, 10. To leave something out for the poor, the glean, that was the welfare program of, of Israel was to leave the fields so people could pick off of it. Le Leviticus 25, 35, help someone that falls in poverty that's among your people. That's something that's predicated in the word. Deuteronomy 15, 7, 7 and 8, and 10 and 11, open up our hand to the poor. Deuteronomy 24, 14 through 15, 
don't withhold wages. If you got a poor guy that's working for you, you make sure you uh, you pay him promptly, as you should. In Proverbs 14:31, he who oppresses the poor approaches his maker, but he who honors him, honoring whom, what the poor, and has mercy on the need. You honor the Lord when you have mercy on the need. That's what the Proverbs 14:31 says. I put it as a life lesson. So first one in here, but keep the poor in mind practically. Keep the poor in spirit in mind also, in heart, in, in your service, and if you can, in your budget. Because God puts a strong emphasis on this. After the meeting in Acts 15, the, church, the big meeting, right? The big meeting. We're going to let the Gentiles in, or are we not? You know, there's things going on. You know, shortly after that, the after part of the meeting, they tell Paul, remember the poor, which I had in mind to do, Paul said, right? So there's this thing about being a minister, a servant to those that are in a dire situation. As the Lord leads. You've heard me talk about it in a different perspective before, but verse 15. It says, You walk through the sea with your horses and through the heat of the great waters. Again, another allusion to uh, the Exodus. God is with you. Verse 16. When I heard, this is Habakkuk, when I heard, my body trembled. When he heard from God, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled within myself. We see this, you know, interfacing with, with God in a real way. I mean, you see it with John in Revelation chapter 1. He fell down as though he was dead before the Lord. You know, talking about my lips quivered at his voice. Isaiah chapter 6 talks, we interface with God in the heavenly realm. He said he's a man of unclean lips. Um, there, there's a deadness in a sense to ourself when we approach God in his purest form. Why? Wow. Because we're following human nature. It's, it's a big part of that. And we can't, we can't connect to him apart from Christ. Obviously, that's the, the biblical thing. Hebrews 12, 21, Moses says uh, in, in interfacing with God at the mountain, Exodus 19, and so terrifying was the sight of all the stuff that was going down. Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. And Moses, to be a man, was a, was a man's man. I mean, later he ends up like kicking with the Og's butt. He's like a 13 foot giant. I mean, you know, I mean, he, he basically warred for Egypt. That's a thing you don't hear a lot about. It's sort of alluded to fought against the Ethiopians. Coming out going before them, but he was a man's man. He was a piece of beast. He's like, I'm afraid. I'm trembling. This is God. You know? And, and it's healthy. Not to like necessarily walk in fright in a sense, but it's healthy to have a respectful uh, reverence and adherence to the Lord and what he has to say to us when he speaks to us. As it's saying in verse 16, when I heard, this, he just heard. The word from the Lord. And now he saw a complete vision of the Lord, per se. And pick back up verse 16. He says, That I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. So there's this, this trembling within himself, and I tremble within myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. Or are you just going to tremble yourself until you fall asleep and get tired? This <laughs> is what that is. And I don't, I don't think it is. I think it's Habakkuk coming back to what the God had spoken to him a little bit in chapter 2. The just shall live by faith. There's this trust that the Lord is just. And when he comes up to his people, he will invade them with his troops. God's going to be taking comfort in knowing God's going to deal with the enemy. Ultimately. He may not even see it. I don't know how old Habakkuk was when he was dealing out this prophecy. We don't hear anything else about it. You know, one cool thought, I just thought this would be a cool thought, but you know, Habakkuk chapter 2 where it says, you know, God tells him to write the vision, write it on tablets. Essentially, he's writing this prophecy. There might be some tablets out there. <laughs> if you look at the word tablets, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not, you know, uh, it's not your iPad or anything. I mean, you know, it's, it's like rock. You know, you know, it's, it could be polished, varnished wood. 
You know, I was looking at the original Hebrew word for that. But why do I say that? Well, because there's over 150,000 plus of them in universities up in Pennsylvania, some in the uh, British Museum, um, that, that are from this part of Earth, planet Earth. Well, you know, it could have been easily part of it, especially if they were rated by Nebuchadnezzar. So tablets, maybe there's a hard copy somewhere. <laughs> Potentially. You know, it would be hard because there's only like 50 people in the world that will translate these things and there's probably not enough money for them to pay to do it, but may never know. Heaven knows, right? But these are written on tablets. And we see that verse 17. It says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and all the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there will be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And that word joy, rejoice, is like a jumping for joy type of, of, of joy. You know, I know it's, it's uh, sometimes when we see charismatic people do charismatic things because we see so many weird things in America in general when it comes to spiritual stuff. I get kind of off put by it personally. I'm not saying that there's not some real joy going on, okay? I'm not saying it's not there. I'm not saying we shouldn't express it. I think we do. I mean, hey, David did, right? You know, he got down doing some worship in, in his thing, <laughs> you know? But, but there's, a, um, there's something here that's special for us to take note of. That verse 17 is basically all, though, basically all these are blessings in a sense. If all these blessings are not for me. I don't get it. I don't have all those blessings and stuff. We have all these blessings that are listed here. Yet I'll still rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in God and my salvation. Job 13, 15 says, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. So there is this joy that God provides that supersedes practical physical blessings. Which often... You know, watch any TV programs about spiritual stuff. Not all, but definitely some predicate a lot of the blessing of God upon the things that come down the pipe. Not saying God doesn't do that. I believe He does. You know, Jesus talks about you know the people that have left for the, you know the world to live for His kingdom. He says you know they're going to receive houses and all kinds of blessings and stuff, but also persecutions. Along with that, right? So it's stuff and persecution. But you know, I was gonna okay, time to read it. I really would encourage, I'm gonna just leave this out here. I was reading through it and I was like, man, we're gonna read this tonight, but we don't have a lot of time. Okay. These bees, these bees. No, but <laughs> no, but it's just uh, uh, I love this section of scripture, Acts 16, verses 16 through 32. It's, uh, you know, the story leading into Paul and Silas being in prison. You know, basically cast out a demon of this woman that's actually saying pretty good stuff. She said, hey, the prophet of the most high God. And he casts it. He get, well, it said Paul was basically annoying. Get out of here. You know, cast the demon out. The guy was making money on this girl because she had a gift of prophecy. It was a demon. He gets thrown in jail. He says they get, they get beaten with rods, striped, and then put in stocks. You know, imagine that happening to you. What would the next verse of your life be? We're going to do it together! <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, help! You know, everybody, I can just imagine so many people just absolutely quitting Christianity right then and there. You know, it's, oh, I don't want to talk about Jesus anymore. Can you let me out here, please? You know, I mean, I, I can see people not bearing the brunt of that. But it says about them, they're, they're, they're joy, rejoicing. They're singing songs. I mean, I don't know if like this is like just sort of a nuance, off the cuff thing. Like you know, Moses went through the Red Sea and they just blasts out this new hymn. You know, Habakkuk goes through this trial and is wrestling with God and blasts out a new hymn. I mean, Paul and Silas on there just like you know, I'm in the stocks. I have no stocks, but I'm in the stocks. I don't know what they're saying, but it's they're they're rejoicing because there's this connection with Jesus in the midst of where they're at. They're so intimate and so powerful and so superseding everything else. It's got joy in the Lord. 
And, and, and that's the kind of joy that the world can't give us. But that we, no matter what your status, where you're at in life, whatever it may be, that we can have that kind of joy. The joy that may make you look a little crazy, maybe. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't judge you. <laughs> I may be critical, as long as you don't knock anybody over. <laughs> put you in your own room. But you know, <laughs> I mean, the Lord's good, man. The Lord's really good. I put a life lesson here. Truly trusting in the Lord in the midst of troubled times produces a joy like nothing else we've ever experienced. That's the kind of joy the Lord offers. It's the kind of joy the Habakkuk is learning. Not by experience. This stuff hasn't yet happened. He knows it's coming. But he's just like, you know what? The just shall live by faith, not by sight. It's good. Good guy. I meditate on all this stuff he did. Joshua, Red Sea, you know, killing off Pharaoh's army. You just let him deal with him. You know, all this stuff's meditating in his heart is producing this song of joy. The verse 19 says, The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like the deer's feet. As long as it's not Bambi, right? Because Bambi got shot, right? <laughs> but the Lord God will make my feet like deer's feet, and He will make me walk on my high heels. You know, this is sort of an observation, probably, from Habakkuk. You know, none of you ever seen, many of y'all been around long enough, you probably got cooler stories than I do. You've seen deer, like, just prancing around, like, just getting around like it's nothing, man. It's just like, shoo, 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 up and down a hill, through the thicket in the woods. You're like, man, how's this? I just expect a deer to just like run into a tree limb and fall down, you know. That would be what I would do if I was running through the woods. <laughs> but, you know, or if I was running up and down a hill, I'd probably, you know, have to finagle myself. I couldn't do it like fast, like they're doing it, all graceful, flying up and down the hill. This is just an observation, you know, that Habakkuk's, you know, is making. He says, God's going to help me to, he's going to give me that grace where I'm not going to stumble, in a sense. That's what he's saying, it's part of this. Last verse of his psalm. You know, this is again, this is a passionate psalm. This is a passionate uh, thing that shaken off. That's what that means. Psalm 37 23 says, The steps, speaking of our steps being ordered, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. God makes us to walk gracefully, as this observation of Acacast. Last verse, last part of here, it says, Two. The chief musician, this is why people believe Habakkuk probably was a priest. That would be the chief musician in the temple. Habakkuk's like, hey man, I got this great hit. You guys need to sing it. You know, <laughs> he passes it on. Maybe he gives it on a tablet. He got this big stone tablet. Sitting up there somewhere with a guitar in the temple. Get ready to jam out with this thing. With my stringed instruments. Now, he's passing off the song you know, the Lord, you know, had given him. He told him to write it down. You know, Ephesians 5, 19 through 21 talks about our, our life in Christ. It says, it says, we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. All of these things are encompassed in our Bible study tonight. You know, giving thanks. This is essentially a lot of these this retrospect of what Habakkuk's doing is, 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 is a way, in a sense, giving thanks by remembering God's goodness, right? We can give thanks in all things. There's this fear of the Lord, right? We submit to one another out of fear of the Lord. Why, why would we do that to one another? Why should I be really afraid of any? Right? Because he's going to snatch a red bull out of my hands. <laughs> he did that one day. But no, but, uh, no, but it's, uh, we, you know, it's, it's, you're made in God's image. You're a part of the body of Christ. You're a part of Christ Himself. Each one of us are. And it's important that we interconnect to one another as such. That's why we treat my own body, should I treat you? You know, to love one another thing. And, and I think it's a, a big thing for us to, to consider. I've got two life lessons to kind of close out our Bible study. And a couple dots. And then I'll close in prayer and we can open up question, feedback, whatever. Some of this. 
Life lesson I put here is that we should meditate, marinate on the promises of God, and pray how the Holy Spirit, how how the Holy Spirit to work in you, can work in you into a life that is passionate, personal, that causes you to rejoice in God in a wonderful way. Meditate and marinate on the promises of God. Pray how the Holy Spirit can work in you to make your life passionate and personal in a way that causes you to rejoice in God wonderfully. That's, that's how the meditation from Habakkuk came. It was a problem that begun with his spiritual or spiritual condition in Jerusalem. And he stuck there and he had a back and forth with the Lord that resonated in him joy. That's what the prayer, prayer produced. The last life lesson I put is that to make it a place, to make a place in your life that you hear from him in a tower as Habakkuk did. This is what he did in chapter 2. He'll meet you and he'll prompt you to walk by faith and you'll have a passionate song unto the Lord. God will stir in you as you wrestle with him a place of trusting in him that gives you joy. In spite of maybe negative things that might be coming down the pipe. I mean, there's still, according to the Bible, other things that aren't looking so good that are supposed to come down the pipe. But we can have joy. We can have peace. We can have God's mercy flowing in us. And let, and let that be yours, personally. I mean, you know, essentially, you know, we got the elders to come and teach. And I think it's an awesome thing because I learned something from each one of them. It's different. Their experience is different. I learned their experience is greater in some areas than mine. And we learn, we learn from one another. We bless one another in doing that. But it's important to have this personal testimony of your discipleship that's with the Lord that pours into a family, a workplace, that pours into hopefully another person. Maybe it's direct, maybe it's indirect. But it's something that carries over. And, 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 and recognize and realize because the enemy wants to isolate you and make you feel like you're not that good. You're not that important. I don't have much to bring to the table. Blah, 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 blah. That's the sort of lies that get fed on a continual basis. But that's not the case. It's not the case. You are uniquely important. You bring a unique value uh, to the kingdom of God, to the body of Christ. And as the Holy Spirit resonates within us and we fellowship, we're together in the Word, we're together in the Spirit, we're together in groups, hanging out, praying together, whatnot, we receive from one another. There's no halo effect. I mean, you know, we shouldn't be giving that halo effect to anybody but Jesus, right? He gets the halo effect, that's it. You know, we get, we get in these circumstances in, in life and, you know, we tend to, oh, you know, that person's really, really doing great for the Lord, you know, or whatever. Probably went through a lot of trials, maybe, to give that impression. But they're just human, just like you and I. They need the same grace, the same mercy, uh, the same love, the same prompting and stirring of faith that you and I need in our moments of distress and discouragement, right? So, I'm going to close in prayer. God, we thank you for the gift of this time uh, to be in your word together. Lord, we thank you for the word that's still alive and, and well by the power of the Holy Spirit. The same word that you gave to back, Lord, and that you give to us, that the just shall live by faith. In spite of, you know, potentially negative things coming on our culture, or, uh, you know, just in life. God, you give us peace. You give us joy. Help us to remember the works that you've done in our past and maybe in our fellowship and in, and, and in our walk with you, God. Help us to hold on to the good and allow you to continue to lead us, God. So we lift up my brothers. Lord, lift up our time now, Lord, if there's anything you want to stir, prayer requests, wives, or further thoughts that you would allow this time to be a blessed free time for, for your glory too in Jesus' name. Amen.